Right. Um, we're now turning to chapter 5, and uh, this is the last of the chapters that we're going to be dealing with sort of theoretical concepts. And the, um, from here on out, we're going to, uh, well, chapter 6 and 7, uh, we'll be looking at some evidence from other primates, our closest living relatives. Uh, and and we'll and we'll take a look at uh, why we we try make those observations of other living primates. We'll talk a little bit about those in the next chapters, and then in chapter eight we'll uh, start to turn our attention to the evidence from the past of where human evolution comes from, uh, and look at the real evidence for it, uh, and and test it and uh, and uh, evaluate it. Uh, before we do that, of course, in chapter 8, though, we have to sort of uh, understand the tools of how we can look into the past. So we'll look a little more de in depth into the archaeological process and the physical anthropological process and, and what, uh, what scientists that observe the past and human evolution are, are looking for and how they're doing what they do. But before we move on, um, we've looked now at the history of of the discipline of, of human evolution, where that those ideas come from. Uh, we've looked at science as a process. Uh, we looked at uh, Charles Darwin's um, concept of, of natural selection and Gregor Mendel's discovery of independent assortment, which gave us the foundation for genetics and natural selection and genetics uh, together. Uh, equals the what we call the evolutionary synthesis, and that's that's really what an evolution is. It's not just what Darwin taught us, but also uh, there's some gaps that were left by uh, Darwin's idea, um, and those were filled in with with genes. So we looked at what genes are, uh, what what is life, uh, and how does it function? How does it reproduce? Because natural selection is working to select organisms that reproduce and pass on those genes into the next generation. That's really the way it works. Uh, and then we looked at uh, the idea that it's really evolution isn't really about an individual organism. It's about, although individuals succeed or fail, it's about populations that uh, for your genes to get passed on, uh, you've got to reproduce. And to do that, you've got to uh, interact with the population and so there's all sorts of factors that are both statistical and physical uh, that go into um, the processes of of someone living their lives uh, and passing on their genes but <clears throat> we hinted at the end of last chapter that it's not the just the genes that uh, uh, are expressed in a physical body. What I mean by that is that your genes are your blueprint. They're, they're, they're your starting point uh, for who you become. But what you actually become is dependent on environmental factors. So we've been talking about how natural selection works on variety in a population. If everyone is the same, if everyone is a, a clone of one another, an, a, a, an adaptation for success is great for everybody. But if those conditions change and everybody is exactly the same, natural selection has only one selection to make, and that is to wipe everybody out. So that's not a very successful strategy. Uh, you don't have to be devising or looking into the future animals most animals don't think about you know their their uh, their futures it's just that if an organism is successful you'll see those genes again it's as simple as that and if they're not successful you will not see those genes again so it's sort of a self-fulfilling uh, principle in that sense that natural selection uh, is really just about do you survive or do you not? But what survives? The genes are what gets passed down, but the genes are imperfectly formed in individual organisms. And we saw a little bit of the way that that takes place last chapter. 
uh, that, um, but we're going to look more in depth into environmental factors in growth and development. That you started out as a single-celled organism. You started out as uh, a, an egg and a sperm came together and each had 23 chromosomes. They came together and for most of us that makes us uh, have 46 chromosomes, which is the normal human number. So you started out as one cell that had 46 chromosomes, and then that cell replicated itself. It, it duplicated, and then that, those duplicated, and those duplicated to create you. But that whole process of duplicating has a chaotic world around it. It has a lot of environmental pressures and, uh, and um, expectations that we talked a little bit about how the cells create the building blocks for making you. So your bones are sort of like a scaffolding that keeps your body up. Your, your DNA tells your cells to create that scaffolding. But you've got to have the raw materials for it. You can't just conjure it up out of thin air. You've got to have things like calcium. And calcium is the hard part of your bone. It's, uh, it's a mineral, and your body uses that mineral to create a, 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 a substructure for you that keeps you up and you're, attaches to muscles and moves you around. Those muscles, those bones, those uh, processes then allow you to go and get more nutrition to th do things like power your brain and see things and talk and listen. All of these things are processes that your body uh, is either successful at implementing or not, and uh, we're going to we're going to look at the processes that uh, uh, the factors that go into building a body, and that also creates variety. So, a identical twin brother or sister that you might have has the ex identical DNA of you, right? So if you have an identical twin, anyone who has an identical twin has, is, has the exact same DNA as their identical sibling. But if you've never known uh, identical twins, you know that they don't end up being identical people. Uh, and there's all sorts of factors that can make them slightly or even majorly different from one another. Different heights, different weights, uh, different, different, uh, um, you know, some might lose their hair, the other sibling might not. Uh, there's all sorts of factors uh, that go into developing a body from that b blueprint that can lead things into, into different uh, results. And that also is variety that evolution is acting upon. So natural selection has more things to select. And so getting all of these elements in the right places at the right times uh, is also part of the evolutionary process because whoever's successful in creating a healthy body that can reproduce, those are going to be likelier to have their genes passed on uh, in the future. So, hate to say it, some of it just boils down to luck. You may have great genes, but if, if you're... Uh, outcompeted or you get unlucky if you're standing under some cliff face and a, and a rock falls on your head. Great genes, tough luck. You're out of the picture. Your genes aren't going to get passed on. That's part of nature too. It's just simply random chance. That also takes place. Now, one of the reasons why this is an important chapter is because when we're talking about humans, we don't think of ourselves, we think of ourselves as having a lot of differences amongst ourselves. Um, it's it's a, an important part of who we are. We have identities, we, uh, we have groups that we belong to. This is a whole other branch of anthropology called cultural anthropology um, that looks at different cultures and organizations and the way that we uh, conceive of ourselves. So uh, that is a, an important element of being a human. But because this is a physical anthropology class, we're, we're trying to look at this from a physical standpoint. I've already said before that race is a non, 
concept in biology, or at least for humans, that we, there is only one race of humans, that's the human race. And the words that we use for, um, for uh, the, the typical races are actually cultural constructs. These are things that we just decided that that's what, how we were going to divide ourselves up. Biology has nothing to do with it at all, in fact. We talked a little bit about that in the sense that gene flow has been keeping us together, that we're not speciating, uh, we are, we're actually interbreeding with one, or, one another enough. And it, in fact, um, uh, and we'll talk about the sort of the history of, of racism, and uh, I, would, I would get into this in more depth of the history of how we came up with the cultural concept of race if we were in a cultural anthropology class. But um, let me distill this into a, a, a one example. We, when you tend to think of races, you tend to think of skin color. Let's face it, that's really the, um, the, the major factor um, that we use. We just we make we make a superficial observation of somebody, and we we make cultural assumptions about that person. And it's the usually the easiest characteristics. That is to say, skin tone, how dark or how light is your pigmentation. It's a bit unfair because, um, first of all, skin pigmentation can change, right? So what if you have a tan? Uh, I would have, I don't, I don't tan. I just turn different shades of pink, but, um, but some people get very, very tanned and some people, uh, are actually their baseline is, uh, is, is a darker skin tone that even not being in the sun, there is, uh, they come from ancestry that, uh, that had parents who were darker, uh, skin tone. Where does that come from? We're going to look at that. Um, the, the, the reasons for why we have differences, right? Why are humans different? Where does that come from? If our genes are all mixing together, where are, is our, where does our variety come from? It can't all be just genes. So, uh, some of them are, so we do, it's not as though we don't have genetic differences. And we, we talked about that a little bit before that we, those are defined as, uh, haplogroups or haplotypes. But there's no rigid line between this haplogroup and this other haplogroup because there is admixture taking place. So you can't just say that one person is part of this group and another person is part of this group because the groups merge at some point. So it's a fall off effect. It's not really a stark line or a box that you're putting people into. And uh, the, so, so where does the concept of race come from, in fact? Well, it's, it, as I said, it's a cultural determination. And I need to be honest about this here. Anthropology is complicit, or was complicit, in um, formulating and perpetuating what we now call scientific racism. Um, in the 19th century, when anthropology was new and being sort of established as a discipline, uh, Europeans and Americans uh, in universities were interested in the variety of people. And so uh, typically what you got were people leaving their own cultures, their own cultures, cultures and going off into far-flung places around the world. Uh, studying cultures that they were unfamiliar with. And these were often in places that were colonies of Europe. Um, a colony is essentially a colonizer coming in saying, I'm in charge now, I own all this stuff, and you work for me. Um, now that's kind of unfair. Uh, I'm, I'm really simplifying this whole situation, of course, but that's unfair. So rationalizing an unfair situation for colonization or things like the institution of slavery, where you're actually taking people and treating them as property to empower your economy is something that didn't sit well with people that actually had uh, time to think about it 
anthropologists uh, observed uh, different cultures that their, um, you know, the Western European and, and American cultures were observing through anthropology, and they saw them as different. And one of those differences was they look different than me. So there was an attempt to classify and place boxes around people. And so uh, Africans were a group of people that were largely colonized by Europeans. Um, the, the countries that exist today uh, were sliced and diced and chopped up and made into nation states in the form of European countries. Same thing goes for Asia. Australia was colonized on as a whole. And um, the Europeans that were categorizing geographical areas were also categorizing the people that were in those colonies that they had taken over. But they weren't, they didn't see them as themselves, they saw them as property or as, um, as some other form of humanity, maybe not fully like them, maybe not good enough for them. And uh, a, the standard practice was to just say, okay, well, those are races. Those are different people. Those aren't us. Why are why are we in charge? Well, because we're we have light complexion, and that is uh, that is justifies the dominance of one group of people over another. And uh, uh, scholars like Blumenbach uh, ha established that there were five basic races. Uh, five basic racial categories. And once again, uh, you've heard about uh, Franz Boas before, talked about him, sort of the founding father of American anthropology who brought science and a little bit of rigorous discipline into, this, into the subject. Good old Franz Boas started to question these five racial categories. He identified that actually there was no real... Uh, there was a continuum between cultures. He recognized that there was admixture. Uh, he wasn't really thinking about it in genetic terms, but he was thinking about it in cultural terms, that no group is an island, that they all have neighbors, and those neighbors have neighbors, and those neighbors have neighbors. So he didn't see that the global cultures were entirely isolated from one another. So he asked a basic question. If there's five racial categories, he said, what about those groups of people? Oh, how do you define them? For science, for it to be science, you've got to have really clear definitions. And so things like skull shape and nose shape and skin color and that sort of thing were used to define races. And Boaz said, actually, you know, that's a f f okay idea, but they the categories that you've put forward to define races overlap. And so if you've got five racial categories and you've got overlaps where the skin color in, in uh, India or Sri Lanka is the same as the skin color you might get in, uh, in Africa or Papua New Guinea, um, are those the same races? If they have the same skin tone, are they the same race? And so people are like, no, okay, maybe you have different combinations of factors. And uh, it all started to fall apart, especially with the overlaps. Because what Boaz would say is that actually, no, these categories aren't stark lines where there's a separation. They overlap with one another. There's a continuum. And so people started to fill in those, those overlaps by having another category. So five racial categories became 15 racial categories. And then 15 racial categories became 30 racial categories. And 30 racial categories became 60 racial categories until it became absurd. And eventually, Boaz challenging this model of trying to box people into biological different units as humans started to fall apart. Um, and so anthropology was complicit in perpetuating scientific racism, but to be f uh, totally fair, anthropology was also responsible for taking that mistake apart and breaking it down into something that actually makes 
more scientific sense, which is to say there is one single race. This has been tested. Uh, Boaz's challenge has been tested uh, after we started to get the human genome as well, because scientifically, if, here's a hypothesis, if um, biological or genetic variation follows these racial categories, right, then you would expect there to be a lot of racial similarities within that group and big, uh, sorry, genetic uh, similarities within that group. So let's say um, my own Irish and German ancestry, you would expect to see a, a tight cluster of genes for Irish and or German ancestry, right? That's, that was, would be what you would expect if that's a biological thing. And you would expect to see very stark differences between those racial categories and another racial category. So Southeast Asian, right? So Northern European and Southeast Asian should be very, very different. As it turns out, there's more genetic and human variation within these groups than there are between the groups, which verifies that Boaz was correct in destroying these racial categories anthropologically. That doesn't mean that we don't use them culturally. When you, take, when you fill in your census, you're going to be asked what your race is. Um, I, and uh, I could go on about th that uh, particular uh, thing, but that's a cultural decision. Uh, that's not a biological um, uh, imperative. It's not a, a biological factor. So we talked about uh, clines and geographical clusters. And so human, human diversity actually does have uh, meaningful characteristics when you think of it in, as gradual change. But it has more to do with the environment than it does to do with genetics. So it's, in other words, if you live in particular environmental factors, your success or failure in that environment is going to be down to the adaptations that you have for that to work. As we've seen before, adaptations are neither good nor bad, right? Uh, a, a, an albino crocodile is going to fail because it can't sneak up on its prey. But an albino rabbit in, a, in the Arctic is going to succeed because they're hidden. So it, it all boils down to what is the environment you, you are in, and a lot of human variation that we see superficially, things like skin color, are, are the result of phenotypic, not genotypic, but phenotypic adaptations uh,